Welcome to the Meta Science Symposium on Identifying Impact Research Topics. I'm Falk Wiede, and my co-presenters are Izzy Gainsberg, Adrian Wilkinson, and Cecilia Tilly. Before we dive into the program, I'll briefly outline the big picture ideas behind the symposium and explain how the different approaches you'll hear about can be combined in order to identify impactful research topics. Scientific research is very crucial at this point for the future of humanity because it determines what capabilities we have and it also informs how we will use those capabilities. If we make bad decisions, we could easily destroy the future of humanity. But good decisions, on the other hand, could create a vast and substantially better future for us. It is clear that, on average, research has been and continues to be highly impactful. And it's also clear that the impact varies very substantially across different research projects, with a small number of projects having an enormous positive social impact. But most research projects having very little impact and creating almost no social value. This is partly because there are virtually no principled methods for choosing good scientific questions and finding such questions is really hard. Meta-science has so far focused mostly on methods for answering scientific questions and much less work has been done on developing methods for finding good questions. The talks in the symposium are addressing this second problem. We are providing philosophical um, principles, useful heuristics, and rigorous computational methods for identifying impactful research topics. These methods can be combined into a five-step process for finding good scientific questions. And the first of these steps is to make a list of potentially impactful research topics by mapping out how science can help us overcome some of the crucial problems that humanity is facing. This approach is called cause mapping. Cause refers to a problem, goal, or aim that motivates people to take action. And mapping refers to the process of creating a diagram that shows the various components and how they are connected to each other. So cause mapping is about creating a diagram of the important problems that humanity is facing, potential solution to these problems, obstacles to implementing them, and steps that research can take to overcome these obstacles. This diagram shows an example of a cause map. The details don't matter. What matters is that cause mapping starts by listing primary problems, such as reducing suffering from mental illness, followed by a second step of listing potential solutions to these problems, such as making psychotherapy more cost-effective, followed by identifying obstacles that prevent such solutions from being widely used successfully. And finally, thinking about concrete research aims that could help overcome those obstacles. For instance, one primary problem many people care about is global poverty. One potential solution is to promote effective charitable giving. One obstacle to that solution is that people don't fully enact their pro-social values. And from that, we can derive the concrete, concrete research aim of developing scalable digital interventions for promoting effective pro-social behavior. This is just a very thin slice of a cause map, but it shows how a primary problem can be connected to a concrete research aim through these intermediate steps. When we have done cause mapping, we will have a long list of potential research topics. The winner down we can then score each of these topics according to its importance, tractability, and neglectedness. And you will hear more about this process in the second talk. Then we can investigate the most um, promising topics on this short list in more detail. And for that, we can um, use the expected more, more value of information framework that we'll hear about in um, the third talk. And then we can go from knowing the value of the research to identifying the most um, efficient way to use limited financial resources and distribute them across the different potential research topics based on cost effectiveness, which is the amount of value that's created per um, dollar invested. And that gives rise to a prioritized list of important research topics. 
Now, the schedule for this uh, symposium is, first we'll have a talk by Dr. Izzy Gainsberg on the importance, tractability, and effectiveness framework. Then Dr. Hayden Wilkinson will introduce the moral value of information framework. And then I'll give a talk on forecasting the social impact of behavior science R&D. And at the end, we have a panel discussion that we've moderated by Cecilia Tilly. You are welcome to um, post questions in the chat. We'll bring some of them into the panel discussion, and we may also have time for open questions at the end. Um, and with that, I give the floor to um, Dr. Enzi Gainsberg, who's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Kennedy, uh, Harvard Kennedy School. All right, great. I'm just going to figure out my screen sharing. Um, also, we're navigating. Uh, I can share my video, but I can't share my, um, I can share my screen, but not my video. So you're just going to have to, for now, listen to me. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you should have full sharing permissions now. Are people seeing my presenter view or my... My normal you see your slide exactly what we should see. Slides, yep, yeah. and you should be able to do video as well. Okay, awesome. Um, well, thanks, Falk, for for kicking us off. Uh, I think this is a really cool symposium. Um, I think all the talks that are to follow will be great. I'm excited for our panel discussion too. Um, so yeah, to begin, I just want to yeah, I just want to highlight that for many of us, uh, a core motivation for being in academia and doing science is because we hope to somehow or another make the world a better place through our efforts. Um, so for instance, in my home field of psychology, uh, there's research that's suggesting that the most common people that choose, uh, that people choose to study psychology in the first place is because they really believe that it's going to allow them to help others and, and make the world a better place. And this, this core motivation, it's reflected in the major institutions and flagship organizations in my fields. So for instance, uh, the APA, the American Psychological Association, their mission statement is to advance the creation, communication, and application of psychological knowledge to benefit society and improve people's lives. Um, and so likewise, I'm also in the world of management and at last year's uh, annual Academy of Management annual meeting, the theme was creating a better world together. So although many people want their research to have a positive social impact on the world, it doesn't seem like people always choose their research topics in ways that are consistent with achieving that goal. So I feel like anecdotally, people oftentimes choose their research topics on the basis of say what their advisor does, what projects offer the easiest path to funding or publication, uh, whether a project is consistent with the ideologies they hold or social identities that are near and dear to their hearts, um, whether the topic is trendy. Um, and oftentimes people do choose to study things that they think are important, but it seems like it's oftentimes uh, without thinking critically about whether that's going to be the most impactful research that they could be doing. Um, I don't want to altogether discount the merits of those criteria when choosing research topics, but if one's goals are to have a, po a positive social impact with their research, uh, I believe that there's other ways that thinking about research can help people achieve their social impact goals. And so in today's talk, I'm going to be discussing this heuristic framework that uses three criteria that can help people prioritize the most important projects. And that's importance, neglectedness, and tractability, or for short, the ITN framework. Um, and I'll get into the details of these ideas later, but before going any further, I'll offer some high-level de definitions of each of these uh, components. So importance refers to the scale of the problem at hand, uh, which concretely is often something like how many people are affected by the problem and by how much. And so sometimes people also refer to this dimension as scale. Tractability refers to how easy it is to solve the problem one's thinking about, or at least the ease and degree one believes that they can make progress on it. So sometimes people also refer to this dimension as solvability. And neglectedness refers to how many resources are currently being dedicated to the problem and also the extent to which the problem has the capacity to absorb more resources such as money or time and attention. So um, where does the ITN framework come from? 
It was developed by cause prior. It was developed by researchers studying the idea of cause prioritization, which is a field that's dedicated to figuring out what global issues we should devote our resources to if we want to do the most good with our limited resources. And ITN, um, it's not the only way to compare causes. So in many cases, it makes more sense to compare potential causes or actions we can take on the um, for those causes on the basis of more precise estimates such as cost effectiveness. And when I say cost effectiveness, I'm really just referring to say the amount of some outcome that people are shooting for per dollar invested uh, in the action. Um, also in the world of health, for instance, it might be the number of lives saved per dollar. Um, and sometimes we do have estimates of this kind of cost effectiveness for specific interventions to address specific problems um, and we can sometimes compare the, the cost effectiveness when we have these standardized metrics of human welfare. And cause prioritization researchers will research these more precise estimates and use them to inform recommendations when possible. So for, for example, the, the graph on the screen here was created by Toby Ord. It shows the cost effectiveness uh, in DALI's averted per dollar, which is a standardized public health metric. Um, it shows the cost effectiveness of different public health interventions that were recommended in the 2013 Disease Control Priorities Project, which is just this massive public health endeavor that tracks the cost effectiveness of different public health interventions. And you can kind of see it follows the same curve that Falk was talking about earlier, where the most effective interventions are vastly more uh, effective than the typical intervention or the least effective interventions. And this, um, yeah. So, the kind of data that or used isn't always available to help people inform their decisions. And that's why cause prioritization researchers developed the ITN framework for situations where the problems being considered don't or can't have precise cost, effective, cost effectiveness estimates attached to them. Um, and finally, I guess before moving on, I'll, I'll offer a preview of another point I'll be making today, which is that the ITN dimensions, they can also apply to what constitutes an impactful research topic or project. So just to be clear, traditionally, ITN has most often been applied to thinking about causes and prioritizing between causes, but I'll also be talking about how ITN can help people prioritize between different kinds of research topics. So back to the framework. Um, again, importance refers to the scale of the problem at hand. And just uh, to give an example, consider the problem of uh, climate change in comparison to ALS, which is a, neuro a neurodegenerative disease. Um, climate change, it's estimated to cause 150,000 deaths per year currently. It's likely to kill millions more in the coming years, uh, displacing more than 100 million individuals by year 2050. Uh, and in contrast, ALS is expected to kill roughly 180,000 people by 2050. So when it comes to scale, how many people are affected, how severely climate change seems to be a more important issue than ALS. And it's not that ALS isn't important. It causes patients and people who love and care for them uh, lots of suffering. But at the end of the day, our resources are limited and working on the problems that are larger in scale can help us have an even greater impact uh, with our careers. So how can we apply this idea of importance to our research as, as individuals? So for folks who work on interventions that have direct impact on individuals, importance would account for how many people that intervention would reach and the degree to which the intervention would actually help them. Um, of course, much research aims to have its eventual impact through more indirect means. And this research still may be very important uh, in, in ITN terms. Um, for instance, it might be important if it informs or has the ability to inform, inform a high importance social issue or cause area, such as climate change or, or global poverty. Um, sorry, my, um, there we go. Um, uh, research can also reasonably be thought of as important if it affects many people in expectation through its ability to inform many different cause areas. So such as uh, a methodological or statistical development that can be adopted by many researchers and, and then applied in many different spaces. Um, finally, research can be indirectly or directly important if it can be tied to policy, uh, and in particular policy around consequential topics and high impact cause areas. Um, and that's because po policy is often an avenue where many people can be, uh, be affected. 
So just some examples of what might qualify as important. Um, and some of these may seem obvious, some of them may seem less obvious. Uh, so for instance, in hindsight, research on choice architecture, such as whether decisions are framed as opt-in or opt-out, maybe this is important research. Uh, this I, is a simple idea originally, but it was able to suggest a really low cost method for making consequential big consequential behavioral changes um, in domains ranging from organ donation to people's savings behaviors. Um, and just to take another life-saving example, uh, some colleagues of mine uh, in a current in-press paper, they've pointed to how basic research on the reliability of teams, how this was eventually translated to best practices and responses to natural disasters. And they ultimately suggest that, you know, this kind of basic work ultimately went on to save lives. Um, and I guess relevant to, to our conference, I would say that important meta-scientific developments are also important in IT in terms um, given the role that science will play in addressing many of the world's biggest problems, and insofar as meta-scientific developments can improve the quality of science across the board and even make its way into policy and, and guide best practices, meta-science seems to fare pretty well in expectation by the importance criterion, um, and especially if people find ways to work on the most important issues within meta-science. Um, so on to tractability which again refers to, to how easy it is to solve or make progress on the problem one's thinking about. Uh, I'll again just give another example of two cause areas. So consider the issue of farmed animal welfare versus wild animal welfare. Um, although there's many more wild animals than, than farmed animals, working on farmed animal welfare may be a more tractable issue because animal agriculture is a human institution that we have much more control over. Uh, so experts in animal wealth in, in farmed animal welfare have a variety of policies and practices that they believe would make tangible benefits for farmed animals. And on the other hand, the world of wild animal welfare, it just seems to be way more complex with less tractable solutions from both a moral and practical point of view regarding how we as humans could go about to improve the lives of wild animals. So as was the case with importance, um, one way to optimize for tractability in our research is to work on global issues or solutions that cause prioritization experts deem to be more tractable. But we can also consider specific dimensions that may be relevant to tractability. So for instance, this could include whether, uh, whether the research topic is super, uh, super complex or difficult, which may, might make something less tractable even if it might be more appealing to uh, a scientist who like to ponder over complex problems, um, how much time or money would be needed to really make progress on the issue, um, whether the topic would have a difficult time being accepted by the public, even if we were to able kind of make progress on it from a theoretical standpoint, um, this might still be a barrier and make, make a solution or, or a problem less, less tractable overall. And, also, a problem might be less tractable if one, as an individual who wants to work on it, doesn't really have the expertise that's needed to make progress on the issue. Um, so these ideas can be integrated into models to rate tractability. Um, so I'm just going to give an example of one scholar who I saw did this, Paul Stern, um, who's an environmental psychologist, developed a model rating the effectiveness of potential environmental behavior interventions. And his model included uh, a term that to me, captured tractability, even though he didn't call it that. Um, he broke this term down into three components that were kind of multiplied by one another. One was technological potential, and this referred to how much um, the relevant technology that was a part of the uh, environmental behavior intervention, how much the technology would actually affect some climate or environmental outcome. So for instance, we might think about buying an electric car versus recycling these two kinds of behaviors have very different environmental outcomes. Um, then we have behavioral plasticity, which was how much we could reasonably expect people's behavior to change. So even if we can make change, um, even if we can make a given change, we might not be able to actually change people's behavior, the, the behavior we want to change. And then initiative feasibility, which is kind of like a macro level consideration of behavioral plasticity, which is kind of, it's the systems level assessment of whether some intervention could reasonably be implemented. Um, so 
I'll finally move on to neglectedness, which, which as I mentioned earlier, is how many resources are currently being dedicated to a problem. So more neglected problems can typically absorb more resources and therefore um, they might have more low hanging fruit for high impact research. Uh, this is connected to the idea of diminishing marginal returns. Um, if there's already a lot of people working on a given problem, it might be oversaturated and there might be diminishing marginal returns to work on, to work on that topic. Um, so just to take an example of neglectedness again from like comparing two causes, uh, I guess we can look at data from 2010, which shows that mental health had a global disease burden at the time that was over twice that of HIV, um, but it received under 2% of the development assistance, development assistance um, globally as HIV, suggesting that, um, again, at least relative to HIV, mental health was, was being somewhat neglected. And if we want to figure out how to assess neglectedness, uh, some possible routes are examining what kinds of topics are or are not being funded, um, and also maybe analyzing what topics people are or are not publishing on or presenting on at conferences. Um, and so, as is the case with importance and tractability, we can also analyze neglectedness when comparing, we can analyze neglectedness when comparing broader cause areas. Um, and we can also compare, we can also think about neglectedness within a given field. Um, so just to take an example of this, um, in a recent paper that some colleagues and I wrote, um, we examined how many publications per year there were on various mental health topics and compared that against their, their global burden of disease to get an idea of which areas within mental health were being neglected relative to their overall scale. So um, moving beyond ITN for a moment, I just want to uh, highlight one more very important ingredient to the recipe on how to do the most good with one's research. And that's the idea of personal fit. So the ITN framework, it was originally used to kind of it was originally thought of from maybe a societal standpoint and how society should prioritize different cause areas. Um, and we can also think of it from an individual level perspective. Um, but when we think about it, the individual perspective, it's also really critical to think about how we as individuals fit into the overall equation, not just how the, not just these dimensions that we think about um, in terms of the research topic or the cause area. Because as soon as we consider ourselves, it becomes obvious that the most effective behaviors that the most effective behaviors aren't the same for, for everyone and they depend on the person. So as a trained social psychologist, I'm not really well suited to work on the technical elements of carbon capture. And that's an obvious example, but the broader point is that we, we can all have a bigger impact when we're able to leverage our unique skills, knowledge, and expertise um, when we're able to leverage those things in our research. And that's because when we have those things, it gives us the tools to unlock the most powerful behaviors. And because that provides us with the capacity to take actions that others would be unlikely or unable to do, it gives us kind of a higher replacement value. Um, also from a personal fit standpoint, well, we're also gonna have a greater impact with uh, when we choose topics to work on where we can sustain our motivation. It just doesn't make a ton of sense for someone to work on even a really important topic if they're not gonna be able to motivate themselves to do quality work on that topic. So, so personal fit when we're actually thinking about our own kinds of research decisions is always an important part of the equation. Um, so before moving on to the next talk, I'll just post this slide here. Um, so this lists cause areas and global issues that cause prioritization researchers uh, have identified as being potentially high impact areas to focus one's work. And so for the most part, these are recommended because they fare well by the, the importance, tractability, neglectedness standards. Um, and to be clear, lists like this, they're always being updated as people do more research and the world changes. Um, but you know, this is just a kind of a working list of some of the, the cause areas and topics that fare well by these ITN standards. Um, so that's all I have for now. I'm just gonna say a quick thank you to co-authors who contributed to some of the ideas I presented today, uh, to Falk for organizing the symposium um, and our other presenters. Um, and now I'll hand it off to Hayden, who's a current postdoc in philosophy at the Global, Prior at the Global Priorities Institute uh, at Oxford University.
Thanks, Izzy. Uh, thanks to the organizers and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, Falk and Cecilia, can you just give me a wave if you can see my slides and it all looks okay? Okay, uh, okay so those of you watching, uh, since you're watching this symposium, there's a good chance that you're a researcher yourself who wants to make a positive difference in the world through your work. Indeed, to make the greatest positive difference you can. So you face a, a practical ethical question. If you want to have as great an impact as possible, what research topics should you pursue? Uh, and more generally, when we're deciding what research to do, how can we assess the impact of different research topics, at least the impact that's actually relevant to decision making? Or if I want to choose research topics uh, so as to maximize my positive impact, what's the criterion for me choosing the best one? And can we say anything about which topics those actually are, uh, about which topics are most impactful? Can we narrow it down and perhaps use any simple heuristics to choose the most impactful topics? So these are the questions I want to try and answer. Uh, and in this very, very short talk, I'll briefly run through my, my current tentative answers. Uh, but first, a, a quick note on what I'm not doing here. Uh, I'm not arguing that uh, we are required to do whatever research is most impactful, uh, that this is some sort of moral obligation. Uh, I'm not arguing that anyone is doing anything morally wrong by not doing such research. Uh, and I'm not talking about this separate issue of what funding bodies should do, uh, whether funding bodies should use the same heuristics that I propose here or the heuristics that he was just talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking about uh, how individual researchers can figure out what projects they should pursue if they're in fact motivated to do good through their work. Uh, so the question that's actually relevant for most people listening to this. So now, to give an answer to that question, first, what is the relevance of, of impact? Well, some researchers might be focused on particular sorts of impact, uh, but for the questions I'm interested in, I'm concerned with the broad moral impact how much better the world is as a result of the research being done. I take that that's what, say, impact assessments and so on are trying to capture, but they, they usually don't do a very good job of it. Uh, I'm also uh, not just interested in how, how much better the world is guaranteed to be. After all, we're, we're always going to be uncertain of the results and the impacts of our research. And we don't want to say trivially that no impact has any, uh, no research has any impact because we're always, it's never certain. So we're interested in how much better the world is as a sort of gamble. Uh, given your uncertainty, given since that's the situation we're in when we're deciding what to do. Uh, and then we have a straightforward answer to the question of what research is most impactful. Well, whatever research results in the greatest expected moral value, given your uncertainty. Uh, and by value here, I mean uh, moral goodness in like a very general sense, not specifically money or well-being, just how good the outcome is according to whatever theory of moral goodness is correct. Uh, but this isn't a very satisfying answer. Uh, you might find yourself thinking. It's no better than just saying what research is most impactful. Well, whatever research the correct moral theory says is most impactful. I, I think we'd like a, a stronger practical conclusion here. We'd like some idea of which research this actually is. Uh, we'd like some helpful heuristics to narrow it down. After all, that's what funding bodies try to do. Um, they're, they're not trying to do a fully, fully general moral analysis of each project, and, and neither should we. So okay, we're going to run through a few possible heuristics. Uh, some of which gets, get used by funding bodies, at least implicitly. So here's one, uh, the size of the audience reached. Uh, the more people the work reaches, the greater its impact. Uh, and it often is better if research reaches more people, uh, at least sometimes that means that uh, it has more opportunities to make a difference in the world. But I wanna say a, a large audience by itself doesn't guarantee that the work actually makes the world any better. So here's an example of it not doing so, at least not doing it to a great extent. So, uh, suppose a historian researches the life and rule of a ninth century English king, Alfred the Great. They learn various salacious details about Alfred's personal life, that of his courtiers and various lords. Uh, then, you know, once this work in history is published, uh, a novelist reads it and recreates many of those details in a novelization. Uh, their novels are then adapted perhaps into a television show, which is viewed by millions of people. Um, those people are briefly entertained, but otherwise go about their lives as normal. And if it weren't for that book and uh, the historian's work, then a, a different show would have just been made instead that was equally entertaining. Uh, so there's actually a, a real world example. I haven't, I haven't read the book or watched the series, so I, I'm not sure how true to the historical details it is, uh, but you can, you can imagine you know, the story roughly going like this. And it doesn't seem like that's made the world much better uh, merely because many people have watched the show or read the book. Um, and yes, uh, you know, I've read through a fair few impact assessments myself. Uh, quite a lot of people when claiming that impact is research, that the research is impactful, uh, say something like this. Well, it was picked up by mainstream media outlets, or it was, you know, there was a novelization, 
uh, and then many people interacted with it somehow. It doesn't mean it made the world any better. Uh, so another case, or no, uh, another heuristic, uh, is that if some phenomenon is impactful, if there's a big problem in the world, then any work about it must be impactful. Too. This makes the mistake of, instead of measuring the impact of research you're doing, you just look at the impact of the phenomenon that you're kind of researching something adjacent to. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, so you study, the as a biologist, you study the relationship between climate change and the breeding patterns of the fictional roly poly bird, uh, you find that rising temperatures decrease the roly poly bird's birth rates. And as a result, uh, you know, one and a half degrees of global warming, as is anticipated, will drive them extinct, even with conservation efforts. And let's suppose that governments, voters, corporations, consumers don't especially care about the roly poly bird. At least the survival of this species, despite being a very bad, uh, the, ex the extinction of the species being a very bad thing, uh, the survival or extinction of it will not tip the scales for any of those decision makers to do things differently and reduce their emissions. So the same amount of emissions will happen, the same harms happen, uh, the bird still goes extinct, regardless of whether you make this discovery. So again, this doesn't seem like uh, you, you've actually had an impact, even though you are researching something you know, very important or, or, or very kind of uh, you know, a big problem for the bird extinct. But nonetheless, uh, if your research is kind of guaranteed, let's assume, not to change that outcome, uh, then it's not, it's not the highest impact research you could do. So those were two heuristics, which I think get implicitly used a fair bit. Uh, and I've got a heuristic that I think does better than either of them. Uh, but before I describe it, I'm going to give you a case where it lines up nicely with uh, what genuinely makes the world better. So suppose you live in a world where many people eat meat, including pork, and they do so largely out of ignorance that pigs are highly intelligent because perhaps science just hasn't figured this out. And as a result, 800 million pigs are kept in conditions of perfect suffering at any given time. Uh, and this is all true to life, except we, we, we do in fact already have the research showing that things are very clever. Uh, so in this hypothetical where we don't yet know that, you study the intelligence of pigs. You find that they rival small human children in their, say, problem-solving ability, memory, and so on. Uh, and your findings are then picked up by an animal advocacy organization, it's communicated to tens of millions of people, and many of those millions of people uh, reduce their meat consumption as a result. And millions fewer pigs uh, have horrible lives on factory farms. So just assuming that pig suffering does matter morally, um, which you might disagree, it's pretty plausible, um, but stick of argument at least. Uh, you think that is, uh, if you think pig suffering is terrible, then in this case, you've got an enormous positive impact by doing this particular bit of research, uh, because that just so happens to be the, the bit of information that many people's decision hinges on, uh, and those decisions have high stakes. There's another case here, which I'm going to skip over, but it works basically the same. Um, this is more of a realistic real world. Um, okay. So the heuristic that the important feature of the, the pig's case, which wasn't present in the previous two cases, uh, apart from the research actually being impactful, is that the research provided useful decision-relevant information to real-world agents, and that that information could potentially make them change their decisions to grow effect. So in effect, it was a case where the research in question has high value of information, and that's the heuristic I want to consider. So value of information is this concept from decision theory and economics uh, of how much it would be worth for a decision maker, at least a rational one, to have the findings of that research prior to making their decision. So uh, uh, and we can, I'm going to make some quick assumptions about what constitutes rationality here. Uh, the standard theory of it is expected value theory, which says that you know, in conditions of uncertainty, uh, the, best, the best action or the best option for you is whatever brings the, the greatest expected amount of value. Uh, so the expected amount, like that's a bit of jargon, uh, just means the kind of average amount uh, where you, you, uh, you've weighted the average based on the probability of different factors. So that'll maybe become a bit, a bit clearer in a second. So if you accept you know, that standard theory, uh, you think the expected value of things is what matters, uh, then you can evaluate the value of a piece of information or of a piece of research uh, like follows. So the expected value of doing that research is the probability that research will change your decision multiplied by how much it improves your decision it does indeed change. Uh, or you know, more completely, uh, the value of information of some piece of research is uh, this, this summation um, here where we're summing up the probability. So, for each possible thing you might find, each F, each finding, uh, 
the probability of that F multiplied by just how good it would be to discover that thing, how much it would improve your decision. And you're summing that over all possible findings. So that, that, that ends up taking kind of the, the average uh, benefit of having done the research. Okay. So I'm going to run through an example. Uh, and here we're, we're just looking at the value of information for a single meat eater who doesn't think that pigs are very intelligent uh, and concludes as, as a result of that that they're suffering from that. So for that person, how valuable is it to have this research about pig intelligence? Well, here's our equation. We can plug in uh, so the value of information of this research equals the probability that pigs are indeed smart. And let's assume that if they are smart, you'll find that out, multiplied by how good it is to not eat them if they're smart, or how much better it is to not eat them. Uh, and presumably that's quite a lot um, you know, if they're very clever creatures. Um, just like the uh, yeah, the badness of eating a, a small human child of similar intelligence. That's be much better not to eat them. So that's perhaps a lot of value. Uh, so that's that term's gonna be quite big, uh, plus the probability that pigs aren't smart whatever probability that is, uh, multiplied by zero, because you're already eating meat. Uh, so if you find, the pig, find out the pigs aren't smart and you continue eating meat, that's just as good or just as bad. Okay, so as long as this probability at the start that pigs are smart is pretty high, um, or you're like pretty uncertain of how the research will turn out, and conditional on them actually being smart, it's a, a lot of value, then this total value of information ends up being quite a large amount. Um, it kind of looks very good um, in expectational terms to do the research. The value of information, at least as it's usually used and as I find it, has some problems. So it doesn't really work in the general context of doing impact research. Uh, here's some problems with it. So first, uh, in doing research, you're often providing information to more than one decision maker. Uh, it's not just a simple decision by one person. Uh, these different decision makers will often face different decisions with different stakes. So again, like that's going to further complicate it. You can't just say, okay, there's 20 decision makers. You can multiply the value of information by 20. Nope, they all have different states uh, and they're different positions. Uh, also, if, even if something is true, your research might not succeed in showing it. Some effect sizes are very small or you need like an extremely high power uh, experiment to, to test the relationship or whatever it might be. Uh, also, at least as I put it, uh, value of information didn't capture the potential harms of finding evidence for false con conclusions. After all, you might find, you know, just by, just by chance, uh, in your trial, you find evidence for something that's in fact false. Uh, you know, you uh, you know, you find some slight positive evidence that you know drug A is really it's more effective than drug B. When in fact, it was just you know, a chancy result. Uh, you know, the, the one in a hundred result that uh, just by chance drug A, the the sample, the the control group, no, <laughs> the treatment group ended up you know better off. Um, so VOI didn't uh, capture that. Uh, also, expected value theory might be the wrong theory of rationality, um, but that's something I'm not really going to talk about here. Uh, and what I'm about to propose can be just kind of modified to fit with other theories of rationality. But expected value theory is kind of the simplest one, so stick with that. Okay, so my proposal is to you know still use something like value of information, but to modify it uh, for this particular study. So here's the proposal. So expected moral value of information for all, or MVPA, uh, which sounds kind of like a football league. But anyway, this is how much better, given your uncertainty, the outcomes of all those decision makers' choices will be if you do the research, taking into account your uncertainty about how many such decision makers there are, what the stakes of the decisions are, how many of them will listen to you as a, perhaps that's sometimes not, not too many, and your uncertainty about what the findings will be. Okay. So, I'm going to make some assumptions again, expected value theory, and if we have the right sort of theory of moral value, um, this will this equation will vary if you have a different theory of moral value, but it keeps it simple. So the MVFA of some bit of research would then be the expectation of the number of decision makers. So on average, how many decision makers will there be uh, who will be affected? The expectation of the stakes of their decision making of their decisions um, relative to the kind of uh, and then we've got the same sort of term as before. So you're, you're taking the expectation, you're doing this probability weighted sum. Uh, now you're summing over each possible finding, F, and each possible truth, T. Because sometimes what you find is not what's true. It might be different things. So then we take the probability uh, of F and T, probability that you find F if T is true, multiplied by how much better it is to find F if T is true. So I'm going to shorten it down to that. Um, 
basically the value of information, taking into account the risk of uh, risk of what you find not being what's true, and then like weighting that up by number of decision makers respect their decisions. Okay. So in question, are the most impactful topics in any given field uh, the ones with highest MP? Um, and that's kind of a tough question. Uh, but to try and answer it, we can ask, uh, thinking about uh, okay, what are all the different ways in which research makes the world better? Um, and uh, you know, is the biggest source of uh, such benefit via providing evidence, uh, which will, you know, more, more evidence or the more useful evidence will correlate with high MVP. So one way is that you do research that creates knowledge. And perhaps knowledge is intrinsically valuable. Um, it's a, the world is better if people know more things, uh, or if we as scientists know more things, uh, even if no one is happier. Um, well, I think uh, no matter what research you do, you're going to generate knowledge. So if just knowledge is valuable in itself, uh, then that doesn't really break the tie for looking at different research projects. Uh, also, uh, I mean, personally, my intuition is that if you're comparing the value of knowing more things versus fewer people living in poverty or you know, people having better lives and experiencing less suffering, I think the less suffering and so on matters far more than the bit of extra knowledge. So I don't think this is going to be where most of the value is. Uh, further source of value here is that research being done is in itself intrinsically valuable. You might think if uh, the world is full of uh, Galileos, uh, you know, tinkering away in their workshops and so on, uh, that that just is like a morally better world than a world of, you know, people watching Netflix shows or what have you. Uh, but I think this has the, the same, same problem. Um, you know, whatever research you do, you're going to be doing research. You're going to be, you know, producing the same amount of intrinsic value by research being done. Uh, likewise, I don't think this uh, compares to the value of, you know, preventing people from experiencing great suffering. So I don't think this is going to drive too many uh, choices of what we do with research. Um, so this is the one I think matters most. Uh, well, research provides evidence to agents to make morally better choices. Uh, and this includes providing the knowledge necessary for new technologies, which uh, effectively reveals new, better options for solving problems. And, you know, the... <laughs> Research that does well in this respect or has a lot of impact in this way is just research that has high MP. Uh, so the more MP, the more stuff. Um, but I think there is a fourth route to impact that uh, maybe rivals MP. So research can also manipulate or motivate or persuade or inspire people to make morally better choices without providing new evidence. Um, and it's unclear to me that uh, we do more good by providing useful evidence for people than by just persuading uh, through our research. So you might think, uh, okay, the science is clear, there's sufficient evidence that smoking tobacco is really, really bad for you and it's not worth it for any agent to do so. Uh, and yet you might think that continuing to do a bit of research on the harms of tobacco smoke um, is useful because you know it gets, gets the occasional headline, it reminds people on the street that smoking is bad and maybe that reduces smoking rates. Um, unclear, uh, but maybe that's a, a bigger path to impact. Um, there are some reasons not to think that this is a great way to go. Uh, one is that seems a little paternalistic uh, to do research just to persuade people. Um, we're, we're researchers, we're not, you know, uh, marketing professionals. Um, and yeah, there might be something morally dodgy about going in with that goal. Um, it, these effects are also riskier. Uh, so when it comes to providing evidence, uh, we, we get more evidence when we get closer to the truth, whereas we don't necessarily get more persuasive when we get closer to the truth. So we might uh, inadvertently do a lot more harm that way. Um, also, I think like as researchers, we often don't know what, what will be most persuasive to the average person. Uh, so I think we might still be, uh, often topics will be tied in their persuasion value, whereas their MPFA might differ enormously. Also, as researchers, you know, many of us just want to discover new things. We don't just want to persuade. Uh, so you know, if we want to have impact, and specifically we want to have impact through discovering new things and informing people uh, and not manipulating, uh, then Maximizing in FIFA is still a pretty good heuristic. Um, but you know, there's some uncertainty there. There's some case to be made for uh, you know, motivating and inspiring. Okay, so a very little time left, but I'll, I'll just uh, run through one very quick objection, uh, which is that, well, if we're, if we're going to try and maximize impact in general, uh, and we're picking our research projects based on that, that seems to rule out kind of blue skies research or, or research that's not. It's kind of driven by curiosity and, uh, you know, what's interesting, uh, which ends, might end up having, you know, more impactful results in the long term. Most of the great results of history uh, weren't 
were, were largely driven by uh, scientists who were curious. So uh, this one paper, uh, they point out that impact-driven research seems to rule out the possibility of open-mindedness in the very start. Uh, statement by the British Philosophical Association say that impact is uh, long-term, unpredictable, hard to quantify, and not the basis for measuring quality of research. And I think it's, I think they're pretty close to right when it comes to impact as measured by um, agencies. Um, but I think MP3 has a bit differently here uh, when we're considering the perspective of individuals. So I think in practice, and FIFA will maximizing people will often involve pursuing very abstract work with only low probability long-term impacts. Uh, because after all, it's probability multiplied by value. Uh, you can have a very low probability, value is enormous, and that's still high on FIFA. Um, I think many of the best options will do that. Uh, also, probabilities involved are the probabilities of successfully finding something out, which do depend largely on the researcher's curiosity and interest. So uh, probably what will be recommended is are topics that the researcher themselves are very interested in. And then just among those, you can kind of, you know, once you pick the interesting topics, you narrow it down to what is impactful among those interesting topics. Um, because those are the only topics you make much progress on anyway. Uh, there's a further sub point. Uh, so what are the takeaways? Well, one, uh, if you want to do the most impactful research you can, what topics should you work on? The answer is not clear. But if you want to choose an impactful research topic, perhaps not the most impactful, but it, you just want like a good heuristic to be sure that you're doing something pretty impactful. A uh, topic with high MV is a pretty good choice. But there's this difficulty. How on earth do you figure out the probability of all these things? How do you like quantify all these you know, numbers? Well, with difficulty. Uh, and uh, I gather that Falk is about to answer that in his talk uh, to some extent. So I'll head over to Falk. Um, Falk, would you like a quick intro? Well, I'll, I'll give you one anyway. Uh, so Falk is a computational cognitive science, scientist uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, where he runs the Rationality Enhancement Group. And he'll be talking about forecasting the social impact of behavioral science r and Over to you, Falk. Falk, you are muted still. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Hey, thank you. So in the talks you heard so far, you learned about the concepts of course mapping, the ITN framework, and the moral value of information framework. And these correspond to these first three steps of this overall method for identifying impactful research topics. I will now um, provide some practical computational tools to apply the expected value, more value information framework to real, real decision, uh, so real, real research topics, which involves some very difficult forecasting problems of identifying what the findings could be and what the consequences of those findings would be if they were to be discovered. In addition, I will um, illustrate the application of this method to a first proof of concept um, research topic and share the preliminary results of that analysis with you. And then I will um, lay out how funding agencies could use future versions of this method in order to set research priorities. So how can we forecast the moral value of research? As Hayden pointed out, such predictions are difficult, but not impossible. Two concrete difficulties are that the pathway to impact can be very long, indirect, and highly uncertain. And the second difficulty is that some research doesn't only generate information that informs our decision between options we already know, but may also create entirely new options that we didn't even consider before. To overcome these problems, our computational methods proceed by first building a data-driven probabilistic causal model of the research project's pathway to impact, and then we use historical data to predict how likely more research on the topic is to achieve different amounts of progress. And we implement this using probabilistic graphical models and Monte Carlo simulations using the modeling tools Wiggle and Guestimate. To apply the moral value of information framework, we assume that moral value consists in directly or indirectly reducing suffering 
or increasing well-being. Moreover, we assume that everyone's well-being counts equally. And under these two assumptions, we can measure the moral value of research by the number of well-being adjusted life years that it's saved or that are created as a consequence of the research. Although this approach is very general, the pathway to impact is very different in different fields. And the discipline that I'm most interested in personally is psychology. Therefore, the initial scope of this project is behavior science research, in particular behavior science research that either evaluates an existing behavioral, educational, or psychological intervention, or might improve, and improve one, or might lead to the development of a new, potentially more effective intervention. For these kinds of projects, the pathway to impact can be modeled roughly as shown in this diagram, where the first step is that the research produces, improves, or validates one or more interventions for changing people's decisions, behaviors, character, experiences, beliefs, or attitudes. And by improving our knowledge or repertoire of these interventions, we are then able to have more positive influence on people's behavior, and consequently, we can increase people's well-being, either directly, for instance, by reducing their suffering from mental health issues, or indirectly, for instance, by changing um, people's acceptance of certain policy proposals, then lead to policies that change people's behaviors in beneficial ways that benefit future generations, and so on. Because the interventions produced by behavior science generally requires some amount of money to deploy, we can think of the increase in well-being as the product of how much more cost-effective or best methods for doing good become as a consequence of the research and how much money will be invested in doing good and these kinds of interventions in the future. As a case study for this modeling approach, I will apply it to Rachel Baumsteiger's research on promoting for social behavior. In this case, the research pathway to impact can be modeled as Rachel conducting research on pro-social behavior results in a new online intervention for promoting pro-social behavior in emerging adults. The deployment of that intervention then increases the frequency of pro-social behavior. And whenever someone engages in pro-social behavior, it increases their own well-being, and it also generates some happiness in the person whom they are helping. And together, these different effects, which persist over time as poor social behavior is not, not only increases immediately, but also over the following weeks and months, then increases the total well-being of humanity. We implemented um, this model as a probabilistic graphical model, uh, initially in guesstimate. This is um, a screenshot of this model. Each of these um, squares is a random variable. Each arrow corresponds to a causal effect between these random variables. One component of this model describes the effectiveness of the intervention at increasing kindness, the frequency of kindness, and the effect of kindness on well-being. Another component describes the cost of deploying the intervention. And a third component combines these two pieces to estimate the cost effectiveness with which the new intervention can be used to do good. Zooming in on the first part, it has one component that describes how the intervention will increase the frequency of pro-social behavior, another component on how pro-social behavior um, increases well-being, and a third component that combines the frequency and the benefit into the total benefit uh, over time. Now let's zoom in into one of these nodes in this probabilistic graphical model, get a better sense of um, what that means. So here we see that this particular variable, the initial effect of kindness on the person performing the kind behavior is modeled as a normal distribution with a mean and standard deviation that are derived from meta-analysis of all previous studies on the effect of post-social behavior on the well-being of the person who engages in it. Now, having such a probabilistic model, we can ask a number of interesting questions, such as, how much more value did this project create? And how much more value could we create by evaluating this new intervention in a large randomized controlled trial? 
and also um, how much more value might a new project that is just being proposed be able to create if the funding agency decides to support it. So now let me illustrate um, tentative answers that our method gives to these questions for the case study of Rachel Baumschlager's project. Our method suggested that there is still a large amount of uncertainty about how cost-effectively this intervention can do good. Um, in particular, there is the chance that this intervention could be extremely effective and a high probability that it will be only moderately effective. Compared to other existing interventions, the new intervention shown in purple here um, has most of its probability mass um, below the known effectiveness of the best charities for promoting global well-being. But it also has a very long tail, uh, meaning that there is a chance that it might be substantially more effective than any of them. So that suggests that it could be very worthwhile to evaluate this intervention in a randomized controlled trial, but a randomized controlled trial is also very expensive. So is this small chance of this intervention being effective really worth it to invest in an expensive randomized controlled trial? Our method says, yes, it would be very worthwhile to do so. In fact, if we ran a randomized controlled trial for costing up to $300,000, that will generate 330,000 well-being adjusted life years. Um, in terms of moral value. So it'd be extremely um, beneficial to do so despite the high amount of uncertainty about what exactly the outcome of the randomized control trial would be. It is quite clear that this would be worthwhile doing. Um, in fact, this randomized control trial would generate almost one well-being adjusted life here for every dollar that it costs. And that's more than 10 times as effective as the best um, charities in the space of global health and well-being. So assuming that when, that this intervention that Rachel Bonschlag developed will be evaluated in a randomized controlled trial, was it worthwhile for her to develop it? And if so, how valuable? Here, our method says that the research and development project that she conducted was in expectation worth 360,000 well-being adjusted life years. That's again, an enormous number. And it is so high in expectation because of the um, possibility that it might be more effective than the best existing intervention. Because if it were, we could invest billions of dollars worth of philanthropic resources in, in a more effective way to do good. And that could um, save so many more people. By contrast, if it was less effective than the existing interventions, then all we would have lost is the amount of money that was spent on this one project to develop and evaluate the intervention. And afterwards, we could deploy fully to the previous interventions. Could we have predicted this? In order to answer this question, we applied our method with a model that only uses information that was available before Rachel started her project. So we predict how effective our um, intervention could be given historical data on previous interventions and we conducted a Bayesian meta-analysis to estimate how long the effects of pro-social behavior interventions typically last. And we found that our method did indeed predict that this project would be extremely valuable. In fact, our analysis predicted an even higher amount of moral value from this project than our exposed assessment suggested. But most importantly, both the a priori prediction and the a posteriori analysis concur that this project was extremely valuable. Now, assuming that future versions of our method that I just illustrated with this one case study will be able to reliably make accurate predictions about the social returns on investment for different research projects, then funding agencies could use it to set research priorities. Um, an important step in deciding how to allocate limited financial resources across many different projects to do the greatest amount of good in total 
would be to rank all of these potential projects by their cost effectiveness and first um, deploy, we sort of first fund the projects that are most cost effective at doing good and then move down the list. This requires being able to quantify the cost effectiveness of research projects. Our method can easily be extended to do that by dividing the MVFA of a research project by the expected research costs. And once we have done that, we can then rank all the projects by this cost effectiveness ratio. Concretely, yeah, we can calculate the cost effectiveness of research in topic X by the MVFA of research in topic X divided by the expected cost of conducting the research that gives us the project's cost effectiveness in terms of well Bs per dollar. Now, um, how cost effective was Rachel Baumsteiger's project compared to donating to a highly effective charity? The answer is it was extremely cost effective. It generated about 340 well being adjusted life years per hour of research time. And that corresponds to about 9.2 well bees per dollar. And that is more than 10 times as cost effective as the best charities in the global health and well being space. Could we have predicted that? To answer that question, we again um, predicted the more value created by her project using only information that was available before she started working on the project. And we estimated the cost of the project based on how much money was um, given to similar projects by the Templeton World Charity Foundation in the past. We found that the prediction for the project's cost effectiveness was remarkably close to the um, cost effectiveness of the project. This is very encouraging for the method's potential ability to predict how cost effective research projects are going to be. So in summary, in these four talks, you've learned about four key concepts for identifying impactful research topics, cost mapping, the ITN framework, the more value of information, and forecasting the cost effectiveness of R&D projects. In conclusion, we can quantify the positive social impact of intervention research and like the other types of research as well with additional work. Um, it is even possible to accurately predict in some cases how cost-effective research in the topic is going to be and future work will extend this approach to identify and prioritize impactful research topics in terms of their cost-effectiveness at, at generating social value. And we also observed that research on promoting for social behavior in particular could be highly impactful. I hope that in the long run, this line of work will shift the priorities of behavior science research and the criteria that funding agencies use to decide which projects to fund towards research that is highly beneficial for the long-term flourishing of humanity. If you'd like to learn more, I invite you to check out these resources. And if you have any questions or, like to, or suggestions or like to get involved in this project, you can reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Falk. Uh, and uh, we will now, yeah, my name is Cecilia Tilly and uh, I will be moderating uh, the panel discussion that we will have now. And I'll also mention we have this Q&A function. We have gotten a couple of questions there, uh, but if you have more questions, you can enter them there and I will keep an eye on it and, and include your questions as well uh, in the panel. Um, I think something that's interesting here is that there's clearly like less action in the meta science uh, community around this um, question about how to choose what we do research on uh, compared to things about transparency and research quality. And there is some tension there potentially with academic freedom and like who should actually be setting their research agenda. And Haydn, I'd like to start with asking you actually, because you, um, you started out with saying that your method is not used for funders or it's not meant to be used by funders. It's meant for individual researchers who already know that they want to choose their topic based on what's most impactful. 
Um, but I wonder, do you think this is the right uh, or most effective like level to address this problem? Um, it might be hard for individual researchers to um, go about this freely uh, unless they have backing of funders, for example, or their institutions. Yeah, uh, I mean, in an ideal world, uh, it'd be great if just, uh, yeah, if, if the top-down approach was possible and, you know, all researchers in the world could work on the most, most impact, impactful projects available to them uh, and that research funds could be allocated in a similar way, um, or, or perhaps not, but at, at least on the face of it, it seems like, a, you know, good at an institutional level to have more of a shift towards impactful research being funded. Uh, but... I, I just personally can't see any way that we we could achieve that. Um, so at least with the the MVFA, uh, also so, so I, either with the MVFA framework or using your know, uh, importance trackability and neglectedness, uh, there's a lot of you know subjective assessment to be made there, uh, and I imagine it would be very easy. It'd be very easy for you know people who want to you know just just want to research a particular topic because that that's the topic they're they're personally interested in uh, you know then on a post hoc basis like rationalizing that to a funder and making the case that it's extremely impactful when it's actually not so impactful uh, according to their own kind of subjective assessments um, because an external funder uh, unless they themselves you know unless the grant maker is themselves an expert on on the topic uh, or you know, as expert on the topic as the person proposing it, uh, they're not going to be in a position to know how tractable it is, uh, you know, exactly where this little bit of research might lead. Uh, they're also not going to be able to assess all the relevant probabilities that, you know, the probability that this researcher will make this breakthrough. Um, it's also uh, perhaps relatively easily easy to just kind of invent scenarios where uh, by some, you know, huge stroke of luck, a particular research project goes on to have enormous impact. Uh, even though in practice that's uh, not actually likely to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I can't see a way where I would trust research funding bodies to, to do this well uh, or in a way that isn't easily then gained by uh, individual grant applicants. Interesting. We have, we have a related question here uh, that had gotten a lot of upvotes also. Um, from some attendee who says that their experience in everyday life as a PhD and postdoctoral researcher is that it's difficult to work on topics supervisors do not work on. And reasons include their expertise, their network, different beliefs about what impact is, and so on. And that it's hard to get funding for topics that's not currently considered important by society and funders. So they are asking if any of you who are speakers have any tips on how to address these challenges on a individual level uh, and how to get to actually do the, the uh, work that you think is most impactful. I think you can take a far-sighted approach and work towards building the skills and developing the ideas for the time when you will have enough autonomy to embark on the project that you have identified to be most impactful. If you're already committed to a particular PhD project and you don't have leeway within that, then you can at least prepare yourself for the next steps after your PhD. So rather take your time, Monsieur. Yes, life is long and it, it, what matters is the impact you'll have over your lifetime. Issy, did you have something to add here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a very common problem and I think the the advice might depend on the field that one's in and uh, the latitude that they have given their field or their situation. But um, at risk of uh, helping people advance moral values that I don't agree with, um, I would suggest that people read about uh, useful negotiation skills and essentially trying to figure out, okay, how can I frame my important topic that I truly believe is really important in terms and values that are aligned with those of my advisor or my institution or the funding agency. And there are, there, there are oftentimes are more points of overlap than people may realize on the surface. And uh, yeah, there, there can be, there can be space to make it work in those situations. If people really think about how they can negotiate, uh, I use negotiate in very broad language there. Thank you. 
Falk, I think you had a little bit of a different angle in your presentation, though. Like, Hayden, you said you, you were pessimistic, basically, about funders being able to make these assessments well. But Falk, you, your presentation seems to be more addressing that actually funders or grant makers uh, could use these tools. Um, why do you have anything to say about like why you are optimistic that that you think this could work? There are some funders who already employ researchers to identify important um, research topics such as open philanthropy. I think such funders might be um, open to professionalizing their research methods for setting research priorities if we can make our method sufficiently easy to apply and train a sufficient number of people, then at some point, funders might be willing to employ people who have been trained in those methods or might be willing to uh, facilitate workshops to their own um, course prioritization researchers. I think this is a low probability um, event, but it would be very impactful. And I think it's worth um, working towards it. Thank you. Um, another question that I think is more on the funder level, or maybe also on the individual level, um, that is about when we do prioritization, many of your examples were choosing between different projects uh, or different research questions within a specific field. Um, what are your thoughts on comparing different fields? If we're talking about funding allocation, it might be relevant to think about how much should we allocate to behavioral science in comparison to physics research, for example? Um, what are your thoughts on trying to do this in a systematic way? And do you think the methods that you're proposing would apply there? I, I, I would just uh, give a quick, easy answer to this question, which is that, uh, yeah, as, as, as Falk's calculations kind of demonstrated, uh, the, the cost effectiveness of a lot of research is just gargantuan <laughs> compared to a lot of other ways to, to spend money, especially, you know, if, if governments are deciding, uh, oh, maybe we want to save some money this year, we'll cut down the, the R&D budget or the uh, funding for universities. Um, I think there's a, there's a strong case to be made there that just in general, you know, uh, rising the tide of or raising the tide of, of research funding is a, a pretty good bet. Um, as, as far as, you know, which specific fields uh, to, to give the money to, um, I mean, I as a philosopher am not qualified to, to, to figure that out, um, but maybe maybe one of the others have a take on this. Yeah, I agree. I think our method can be used to make a strong case for more research and R&D funding, and that's probably most important, more important than um, researchers arguing with each other about how to allocate too little resources between important projects. Um, that said, I, I think it, the same approach that I outlined can also be used at the level of research fields and from there on also at higher levels of um, yeah, disciplines even, um, where the, the discipline or the field as a whole can be a sort of as impactful as the most impactful topic within that field. And everything can be compared in the same currency of how much increase in well-being will there be, will there be as a consequence of the research in whatever field it is per dollar uh, on in the, of research spending. So it is possible. Does any of you think that anything other than well-being should be taken into account here? Like I could see a lot of researchers thinking here that there are other things as well and that well-being, like if we compare it to charities, for example, that, that research has other objectives as well. And there are things like understanding the universe or understanding the origin of our species, for example, um, that might not be easy to translate to just increased well-being. But you you are all pushing pretty strongly for the well-being angle. Uh, do you have any doubts or do you think this is the sole purpose of research? I, I would say not just well-being. Um, I mean, there's, there's plenty of other uh, values that seem potentially morally important. Um, so uh, if, your if your research can uh, persuade decision makers or can 
uh, provide sufficient evidence to decision makers to you know correct some great injustice um, that seems like plausibly also very high priority. Um, yeah, and as far as even within well-being, there's a, there's a lot of different kind of sub questions. Uh, you might think that preventing suffering is far more important than you know increasing happiness uh, of people who are already pretty happy. Um, so if you're deciding you know whether to uh, if you're doing if you're assessing the value of research that might just you know improve quality of life in some way like Denmark even more um, versus uh, some research that uh, might be you know especially research that that uh, might potentially benefit you know. You know, pigs and chickens on factory farms uh, who you know, are clearly living far worse lives uh, than uh, those of like especially rich, uh, well looked after humans. Um, then, yeah, the, 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 there's also issues there of uh, what you prioritize. Um, also, when it comes to, uh, yeah, so there's, there's there's one potential value of like the well being of currently existing people or the well being of you know uh, people who will inevitably exist in the future. There's also the potential value of uh, of bringing more people into existence, or you know, saving humanity from its own destruction, or something, uh, or or likewise, the dis the disvalue of you know humanity not existing and there being no kind of well being in the first place. Uh, so these are kind of different values, which you might you might value either of them uh, like to a differing extent. Um, yeah. So so, so well being isn't like cut and dry one concept. <laughs> I think conceptually, most things that people value and care about can be derived as valuable in terms of the well-being that results from accomplishing those other values. So at least at a like, fundamental philosophical level, we could probably um, derive all of the other values from well-being. So in that sense, this framework could be inclusive. But I also want to be clear that I don't think that it ever will be the case or should be the case that all decisions will be made exclusively based on well-being, but because we are so far away from it, I'm not worried that this will happen anytime soon. So at this point, I think we can make more, we have more to gain from making more decisions based on well-being considerations um, than fewer. And I was, my, my concerns will shift when 99 or 95% of decisions are made based on well-being. I can't, I can't say I have anything to add above and beyond what Falk and Hayden said. They, they kind of echoed maybe the things that I was thinking. Thank you. Esse, I can follow up anyway with a question that I think was asked during your part of the presentation. Um, that uh, was from Larry in the audience who asked if there has ever been a hindcast analysis of cost prioritization for previous research programs, for example, penicillin, uh, polio vaccines, or the Green Revolution. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's definitely been research on, you know, people's estimates of the cost effectiveness of that research or the estimates of the, uh, num the amount of lives that were saved as a result of doing that research. And I don't have numbers off the top of my head. I recall them being extraordinarily large um, and kind of like in line with the value, like, you know, high in MVFA, <laughs> obviously. Um, so yeah, people do, um, people do look to the past and kind of try to think about, I, I don't know, I don't know how much of that research is specifically looked at the costs that were involved. I know that they more typically think about the lives that were saved, but the number of lives that were saved were so high by some of those high value uh, health interventions that they, I would presume that they would dominate the costs that were involved. Um, I don't think, I don't, I don't know. And, and I'm not a cause prioritization researcher myself. You know, my, my role and my thinking was when I, when I started becoming interested in this is how can we export some of these concepts to help people choose research topics in psychology and the behavioral sciences. So I can't tell you what else has been done. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know how people were thinking about the concept of cause prioritization back then. So if the angle of the question is, how were people making decisions on what to research at the time that these interventions were being developed? I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know if people 
have taken a retrospective analysis or historical analysis of how people were actually going about cause prioritization a uh, hundred years ago, um, so or, or eighty years ago. So that's a good question, and I'm not sure Hayden, Hayden, you might know. Yes, yeah, some nope. you might be interested in that assessed retrospectively the social returns on investment for behavioral science, social science, R&D funded by um, USAID's Development Ventures Innovation Fund. There's a paper by Richard Kramer um, on that. And there's also uh, work on the cost-effectiveness of past agricultural research in the developing world. These are the two examples of historical analysis of cost-effectiveness of past research that I'm aware of. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from the audience um, that is touching on that, um, yeah, partly that society today may not always appreciate or realize um, the topic or the potential impact of your research. And they're pushing for that basic research uh, maybe doesn't have a clear applied value yet, uh, but that might still be very valuable in the long time scales. And I think this uh, relates a bit to something you said, Haydn, that you actually would expect uh, using MVFA to uh, lead to more of this kind of like low probability, high potential impact uh, kind of research. Could you explain a bit more? Because that sounds like you think this would actually promote basic research. Yeah, uh, although I admit that's pretty speculative. Uh, so. When it comes to uh, when it comes to striking a balance uh, between research that has like very direct, very high probability, predictable impacts, and research that uh, who knows how it'll turn out, uh, or like very, very basic re research, research that's very kind of separated from uh, potential impact, um, we we definitely want to strike some balance between the two. We we don't want all research to be of the former type. We don't want to say only the former type is impactful, and likewise. Uh, we don't want only research of the, the latter type, or we, 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 do, we don't want like exclusively basic research happening, including uh, research where there's no conceivable way uh, that it, it would actually pay off. Um, yeah, of, of course, it's going to be very hard to uh, figure out of the basic research topics, which are the ones that have this uh, small probability of an enormous payoff and which ones just have no probability of any payoff. Um, so yeah, my, my best guess at like a, a good way to approach this is, uh, yeah. So certainly, like trying to come up with a story for each each given piece of basic research, uh, by which uh, you might, uh, you know, considering what you don't know, uh, what might you find out via that research that would uh, shift the way things are currently done, uh, or yeah. Given uh, given what technologies we you know if it's say fundamental physics research and you know we currently need technologies that solve such and such problem uh, we can narrow down at least somewhat uh, what fundamental physics will provide us with new technologies or you know give the building blocks of future technologies that will solve those particular problems um, like we 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 know that further further work on um, uh, yeah the the basic components of photovoltaics. Uh, are more likely going to more likely to give us solutions to uh, to climate change than uh, yeah research on perhaps the nature of black holes something um, even though in the the long run like the black hole research might also be really really good um, yeah but uh, it is very hard to kind of like sift out the things that have the you know to sift out the gems from the from the rest of like the things that have a particularly strong case of uh, enormous impact. Um, and it's largely, largely going to be down to experts in the particular field, uh, thinking through, you know, what they think they might find, uh, and then also, you know, figuring out what the implications of that finding would be. Do you think there's a risk that this kind of like quantitative calculations where you try to like actually estimate a number to compare with something else? Um, like if this relies on estimates that are very difficult to make, that it becomes too sensitive to this so that it's like, will, will it always actually improve how good decisions we make or will it just give us like a number to back up a decision that is actually not of a better 
quality than it would have been without the number. I'm not 100% sure. Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, there's, yeah, there's certainly some risk of this, especially if, uh, you know, if, if people are abusing the MVPA uh, calculation or, or they're abusing the, the ITN framework, likewise. Um, yeah, if people, it, you know, if someone just wants to justify their pet research project and claims that, oh, it's a very high probability that I will in fact discover this thing despite not yet having researched that thing. Um, yeah, it, it seems like it, if you go into this being kind of unbiased and uh, using the best kind of evidential standards to, to figure out how likely it is that you would actually find something out, uh, or perhaps like deferring to your peers and asking them, you know, how, how likely do you think it is that I discover this thing if I run this experiment? Um, and yeah, also appealing to like other subject matter experts when you're trying to figure out the then implications of, of finding that thing. So, you know, if a, if a physicist is, uh, you know, uh, doing some research that might just ever, ever so slightly might, uh, you know, be the, the crucial breakthrough in like fusion energy, um, they should talk to non-physicists as well about uh, what, you know, you know, cheap, almost free, freely available energy would do to the world. Um, <laughs> there, yeah, they shouldn't stick entirely to their own expertise there. Yeah, so there, there, there's way to, ways to mitigate this risk, but there is still certainly a risk that you know people will, will make mistakes and miss out on some some very good projects. Isi, do you think uh, do you have an opinion or an intuition about like how applying these kind of methods would shift the focus between like very applied research or very uh, fundamental research? Um, I want to answer that, but can I go back to asking, saying something, going back to the question that you asked Hayden? Yes, please do. a thought on the matter and seeing what Hayden as the philosopher of the group thinks about the topic. Sorry to put you on the spot, Hayden, but, um, you know, if I think about, you know, this idea of what, what if Invifa dominates decisions um, it kind of is like reminiscent of this idea of like Pascal's mugging maybe, or like the idea of these like high expected value, low probability decisions starting to dominate all possible possibilities. Um, and how do we deal with that? And it's reminds me, I guess, of like, um, how people think about instrumental harm in utilitarian frameworks. And that's a different kind of problem to deal with. But when we think about instrumental harm, we're thinking about, and Hayden led this, like he's not advocating that MVFA involves research that involves harming some to help many. Like, and so, and, and I think the reason that people typically don't endorse instrumental harm is people typically don't want to live in a society that has that as its norm. Um, and I guess I think about a similar idea around uh, like, risk preferences. And so instrumental harm is a bit different than risk preferences when we're thinking about expected value. But I guess the, the what I'm getting at here is like how we deal with the potential for these potentially super high impact uh, expected value calculations that, con that suggest basic research dominates all, if that were to happen, is to like essentially account for the diversity of risk preferences in society and ask ourselves um, how to, how do we want to like account for the fact that not everybody wants the, our money to be spent on like super risky bets. And so I'm curious, like, do you see those? Do you, am, is that like a fair parallel to draw between instrumental harm and uh, like, risk preferences um in and in vifa and expected value i think so especially well so so like one way one way in which it might not be is that uh even if we accept like expected value theory as the correct theory of rationality uh there's there's one question of you know what the entire you know community of scientists should uh choose as far as research topics and what i on the margin should choose given the current allocation of everyone else's time and effort um, and for the for the latter, it seems fine for me to take you know extreme long shots and do lots of basic research. Uh, if it's the the former, and you've got a, a funding body kind of top down deciding what everyone does, uh, you maybe don't want to put all your eggs into the the the, the basic research, the the kind of long shot basket. Um, so yeah, like 
the uh, the appropriate theory of rationality might be different for those two different situations. Also, uh, expected value theory might just be false in general. Uh, so perhaps uh, the right way of calculating this isn't to, you know, won't result in every, everyone going for, you know, these extreme long shots. Um, and we can we can account for risk aversion and so on in like the, the usual ways that economists do uh, when they're, you know, modifying expected value calculations to, to take account of that. But that's, <laughs> that gets complicated. Okay, I can... I, I know we're short on time. I can try and answer your question, Cecilia, but you might have to say it again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was just asking if you would also expect, like, if a lot of researchers starting to use these methods, would you also as expect, as Haydn, that this might lead to more of this kind of high risk, uh, high reward research? Or would you expect it to stay kind of the same or shift more towards these kind of safe bets research? Yeah, I think um, it's tough to say. I think there's still going to be a lot of people and it's just going to depend that the people's risk preferences will vary even if they take a overall like welfareist approach and want and, and are using welfare as a criteria. I still think there, I realistically don't anticipate there being like a strong shift in, I think it's, I think it's easier to sell people on wanting to improve people's lives and doing it a lot than selling them on the idea that they should also take the riskiest bets of all time, uh, no matter what. And so therefore I think there's going to be a diversity there and, you know, what shifts and how much it shifts will probably be also dictated by, um, you know, the norms of funding agencies and incentives. Uh, because as Hayden said, we can always do what we want to do on the margin and we can make decisions, but we do know that people's, what they do will be somewhat guided by, like what's professionally prudent. Um, and so I think like also people's behavior will be dictated by what is being valued uh, at institutional levels. Thank you. We are running out of time. So I will hand over to Falk to finish in a minute, but I just want to give each of you a chance to say if there's anything you would wish for to happen in this field in the next couple of years. Uh, Do you have a new wish list? Yeah, I would very much wish that both individual researchers as well as um, research funders came to prioritize research based on the social value and take the opportunities that research has to make the world a better place into account when deciding what research to uh, engage in this research to advocate for and this, which research to fund. I think we really have a great opportunity as researchers to make the world a better place. And um, I would like to encourage everyone to believe that we really can uh, make a difference if we try. And it, it's worth trying to engage in these potentially more difficult, um, less trodden paths to um, do impactful research. And that is very much worth the cost. And I would like to see a shift in the direction of taking the social value of research topics into account at all of these levels. Thank you. Maybe hard to follow up on that one. I don't know if Isi or Haydn has anything to add. I would second almost all of that. Um, but I think I'm more skeptical than Falk of uh, funding bodies, or at least, you know, centralized government funding bodies doing a good, dip, good job with this. Yeah, I think um, I also third what, what Falk said. And I guess uh, I maybe am, I don't know if I'm skeptical like Caden, but I do think that kind of, as I was saying in my previous comment, so much starts at the top. Um, and, and we know that we can tell anybody and anybody listening to this can make and in, change individual decisions if they want. But um, I do believe that the most like promoting the most impactful research, this our symposium is great. Sure. But it, it will be most impactful when funding bodies and institutional incentives uh, align um, with that goal. So my hope is 
that down the line where that's able to change. Thank you. So I'll hand back to Falk to finish. We had the request also to get the links posted in the chat. I hope you, Falk, are able to do that. And somebody's asking if the recording will be available somewhere online. And the answer is yes, but I don't know exactly where. Uh, Falk, you are still muted. Sorry. Yeah. The recordings will be posted on the um, website of the symposium. And I'd like to thank all of you for attending the symposium and participating in the discussion, asking your questions, thinking along. And um, if you would like to learn more, here are some uh, links that you can check out to learn more about our research prioritization uh, project. If you'd like to um, collaborate on the project or if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. This is a very open collaborative project. There are many opportunities for you to participate in any way that, that may suit you. And finally, if you'd like to try out some of the ideas that you've seen in the first two talks in the cause mapping and the important structurability and effectiveness framework on your own research topics, then you can check out this um, spreadsheet linked here and just put these ideas into practice and thinking about what you want to work on in the future. And I put all of these links in the chat so that you can uh, follow, follow them and check them out. Thank you very much for attending.